Omar Abdul Fattah of Ask a Muslim Facebook page, which has 1.5 million Facebook followers, and Abdullah Gondal discuss one of the reasons why Omar is confident that the Quran is the word of God because of the Surah Like It challenge. Abdullah Gondal destroys the challenge completely, bit by bit, until there's nothing left. Have a listen. Now, you wanted to talk about like the Surah Like It challenge, like, like bring a chapter yeah. like it. Now, yeah. uh, that challenge itself is so arbitrary and subjective. And I've been actually doing a lot of research on it. I've been, I recited some chapters like it in some videos and I, I, I analyzed that. and I, I just made a, a recent video about the, the call the Meccan poet was uploaded on Samir's channel as well, where I recite some mm. pre-Islamic poetry, mm. some contemporary poetry of Muhammad. And then also there's a part two coming where I'll analyze the challenge itself in great detail in regards to how Muhammad was inventing words or forcing rhymes. The problem, first of all, like, like I'll start with is the surah like a challenge, the Quran doesn't give a standard what it should be judged by, okay? Secondly, the Quran then says that it's, uh, it's, it says Arabian Mubin, which is clear Arabic. Arabian Mubin, yeah. Yeah. Whereas some scholars say it's pure Arabic. Now, if you notice, like in, uh, in Surah Teen, it says, what Teen was Zaytun, what Turi Sinin. Okay. Yeah. But then in, uh, in other verses, in, uh, in Surah 23, Surah Mu'minun, I think Surah verse 19 or 17, it says Turi Sina. Mm. The Sinin and the Sina are the same word. The spelling has been changed to sinin just to force a rhyme there. Okay. Mm. Then there is the same problem with Ilyas and Ilyasin, which it changes within a span of 15 verses in the same surah, and between 37, 123, and 37, 133, I believe, where Salamun ala Ilyas, and then it becomes, I think, to Ilyasin to just hold Ilyasin, the rhyme. Yeah. So what I'm going to bring it back to at the end is can I also force rhymes like this without being criticized when I'm attempting this world like a challenge? Secondly, the Quran uses a lot of foreign vocabulary. Now, granted, there are foreign words and loan words in every language. Uh, this reminds you, we'll come to the inherent subjectivity of the challenge by using an artistic form of human expression that is language to concoct a challenge. Uh, and then the problem is, if the problem gets worse is when Muhammad invents Arabic words himself to hold these rhymes on purpose. Like, uh, uh, as in Surah 80, 31, it says, Abba is a word that there has no meaning. He just put that word in there and it's said to be Abba. grass. Then there's the word Qaswara. There's a word, uh, Zanjabila, Tasneem. Yeah, Tasneem in Surah Insan. And there's two, three verse words that are all foreign are all invented. Sometimes they're not even used before the Quran ever. And they're used to hold rhymes, okay? So again, I'll come back. Can I make and invent words and then also borrow words from different languages and attach meanings to it to make a surah like it, right? I can like use half a sentence in English and then one word from Urdu or Persian and there you go. Or like half Arabic and then one word from Urdu that makes a rhyme better. Then also, uh, there are parts of the Quran I'll give you, they're very, very eloquent and very well written, but there are other parts that are very similar to soothsayers of the time, and that's what the the Meccans of the time noticed, and that's why they called him a kahin and a soothsayer. Mm -hmm. And even Marjan Van Putin, who's a very, very big scholar on this subject, also said that, listen, there are amazing, striking and palpable similarities between, like, let's say, the beginning of Surah Mursalat or Surah Adiyat with Muslim's poetry. And then another problem occurs is can I use Quranic phraseology to use within that challenge? Because when you actually look at the pre Islamic poems, like the Mu'allaqat, or some pre Islamic poetry, like one of the surahs that are cited, we call the Surah Shariq, it literally talks about the knocking sad. It uses phrases, one Najmat Tariq, Layl al Ghasiq, all these words. So you can countered that point and say, wait, was Muhammad copying from the poets too? Or you can be more nuanced and say, okay, well, when you limit a, a person to a certain language, you're bound to have the same expressions repeat over and over, right? And that's, that's normal, that's inevitable, because the rules of linguistics uh, have this entailing. Then another problem is like Arabic now itself has evolved so much since the seventh century. Can we use modern Arabic to meet the challenge? So all in all, what I wanted to get to at the end was that there's so much subjectivity and arbitrariness in the Quran itself when it 
comes to this. Then there's the problem of iltafat, like changing pronouns, where Allah would jump from he to v or singular to plural. If a normal Arab person were to talk like that, he'd be vehemently criticized for not knowing Arabic. So when you when I think about it in reality, the challenge it doesn't make much sense because it's centered around a a, a linguistic claim. And the, what also bothers me is this God who's omnipotent was doing jaw-dropping miracles in the past, like bending the laws of physics, would leave us a linguistic, a subjective linguistic claim of language as his biggest miracle for the end of, till the end of times. It just doesn't add up. I'll take a higher take on it. So when it comes to um, just the first thing that you mentioned about like Waturi uh, Sinin and Sinai, I mean, with Arabic, you know, you have mu'min and, and mu'minin. Um, and I just think that we need to be quite careful when we impose, I guess, our understandings of language onto 14th, you know, I guess, <laughs> 7th century Arabic. Uh, and I'll give you just a very, very, I guess, modern example in my life. Like when I'm learning, uh, when I learned Japanese, I used to live in Japan for two years and I learned Japanese. Right away, I started to notice drastic differences between English and Japanese. For example, in English, if you're talking about the weather, you'd have to say, oh, it's so hot. It's so hot out or it's so hot. But in Arabic or in Japanese, you just say one word, atsui. And people just understood what you were saying. When it comes to the language of the Quran um, as a whole, the Quran doesn't say, oh, you know, if you if you doubt that it's from God, then produce a book like it with, with many rhymes. Like, that's not what the challenge is. It says, mithliha, like it. Um, and so to, I just want to make sure I'm addressing all your points because I'm not writing these down. So I'm just going off my short memory. Um, in regards to your, your third point about, uh, words being invented, uh, there are many words, for example, that were used at the time. And then when people were, uh, in the Hadith, like they're, they're trying to understand them. It's like, what does this word mean? Um, and I think just because he used a word that maybe we don't understand doesn't necessarily make it factually incorrect. And if we think about it logically, like, let's say, okay, let's say somebody, I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody was trying to invent their own religion. Um, and they come up and they start speaking language. <laughs> they start saying things that nobody un else understands around them. It doesn't seem like the best way to get followers for your religion. I'm living in 2019. Arabic is not my first language. And when I read the Quran, it's, it's very clear to me, alhamdulillah, like the majority of it. Obviously, there's some words that I don't understand. And so I ask, I go to the tafsir and then I ask native speakers. Um, but just reading it as a whole, it is, it is quite clear to me. Um, and in regards to the subjective nature of our, of the challenge, and I, and I agree with you, I think that there are certain things that, um, for example, like me, I'm studying, let's say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. Okay. And you give your kid a rubric, right. And you say, here's the rubric. How creative were you? Demonstrates creativity, demonstrates not so much creativity, demonstrates ins insightfulness, uh, explanations are comprehensive. All these things, we write them down on paper, but at the end of the day, there is going to be some level of interpretation. And I do believe in objective, I do believe in an objective standard for certain things. Like I think some things are inherently right or wrong. And in the same way, some things are inherently powerful and eloquent and some things aren't. So that's kind of, that's kind of how I understand it. And, and I still pose that challenge because it's not my challenge. Like I don't see like, like what people need to, I guess, need to understand is that I don't necessarily have a personal interest in preserving the Quran. Like it is my faith, obviously, but it's not like I said, oh, I'm giving you the challenge. No, the challenge is from God and it's presented to humanity. So that's how I see it. It's like, I, I'm just expressing it. And whoever's willing to take that challenge, I invite them to it. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, circling back to if it's a subjective challenge and it's, hot, it's got no real uh, measures, like what would constitute meeting this, the challenge. And it's like, kind of like... Somebody could say to him, Shakespeare seems more eloquent than the Quran. Somebody could say some somebody else's book is more amazing than the Quran. I mean, you're saying that rhymes uh, per se, but 84% of the Quran is rhyme. You know, you can't run away from this, this linguistic analysis. Uh, yeah. And the point is that a, an omnipotent God would propagate that as the most uh, important or the pinnacle of his, of his challenge or his miracle work is kind of, it doesn't add up Sorry. to me. May, may I respond to that? Because I forgot to respond to that. Yeah. Um, so uh, if we go back to the life of like Jesus and Moses, you know, Moses, uh, according to Islamic belief and other beliefs, he split the sea. Jesus, you know, healed, uh, healed the sick and, and did amazing miracles. He brought the dead back to life. Um, 
these are obviously miracles that you might say in comparison to the Quran. Some might say, well, all oh, those, those seem amazing. Um, now, the reality is even people who saw those miracles, not all of them believed, right? According to how many disciples did Jesus have? Like 12, depending on, on what number you're using. But seeing those miracles didn't necessarily equate to believing in God. Now, we might say, why did God leave the Quran with us and not something else that, you know, we could observe? Um, first of all, the Quran says, Inna arsanaka illa nadiran wa bashira. We just sent you as a warner and as a bringer of good tidings. And he came down with, with, with the truth. And the way I see it, why a book as opposed to something else? We live in a literate society, like majority. And obviously, obviously not everywhere in the world is, is as literate as Canada. And, you know, historically, people haven't always been literate. But we believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the final messenger. So in order to preserve the message of Islam, and if he's not going to send any more messengers, he's going to preserve the book. And the book is something that can easily be accessed by all people, right? And we have to realize that, yeah, not everybody reads, but people were reciting the Quran, people were memorizing, right? People have memorized it without even, I would imagine, without even being able to read it, right? A lot of, I memorize a lot of Quran just from listening to it. So I, I see it as a book because it's something that transgresses uh, time and culture and place as the final messenger. If we were living at a time when there would be more messengers, then you could say, well, yes, Muhammad was sent, maybe he made the moon, he turned the moon to the sun and flipped the sea upside down. And people saw that, saw that at the time, but we can't see that after that. Well, right? one, one could counter that claim, like, why does God keep showing his best miracles to people that can't record or verify his miracle claims that are living in this era of superstition and not, uh, not, so, well, not so scientific litter thousands of years ago? Then secondly, um, why would, uh, like, if you look at the Quran, the content of the Quran itself, I mean, uh, there are many other books preserved that uh, that are also religious books, and they're books they we can read. So that argument doesn't really add up to me in a way that why would God just preserve it in the book form? Uh, Do you mean like scriptures? Do you mean like like the Bible and the Torah? Yeah, there, there's other books that are in very much conflict with the Quran, and they're also kind of preserved in a way that echo the, the the teachings of the time. Now, when you analyze the content of the Quran. Like we were talking about the science, it reflects the cosmological understanding of 7th century Arabia. It reflects the, let's say, the moral codes of 7th century Arabia. It talks about Muhammad's personal life and his wars and his wives. And then there's these verses of convenient revelations as well, where like, you know, verses that kind of benefit Muhammad, like him marrying his adopted son's wife and then him getting a special exception to marry as many women as he wanted. And, you know, verses that are coming down where Muhammad's companion just captured women and then they're being allowed to take them as sex slaves just because even though they're still married to their husbands who might still be alive. Uh, and there are lots of things like you can you can say that the Quran looks like a very uh, outdated and obsolete book that has preserved the teachings and the understanding, I would say, of the seventh century Arabia, but is not necessarily applicable to all of humanity till the end of times. That's what, how I see it. Um, okay. Like, for example, like the stories in the Quran itself, like uh, there's this one in Surah Baqarah, it's very funny, where the, the piece of dead cow brings a dead body back to life by Moses, that dead person. Then there's these other stories where he hits the stick, the sea parts, the water gushes out of the stone, mm. and uh, Abraham gets thrown into the fire, and there's all sorts of these miracle mm. stories. And there's not really any evidence behind them. And they're kind of almost like copied over from, from previous books too, like the Bible. And even the creation myths, like we were talking about, echoing the same Sumerian, Greek, and Roman understandings and their stories. Mm. And there's a, ch a claim that was put forth by the Kofar, like, Asatiru al avalin that these are the... Right? Yeah, they so they, the even stories, noticed, or, yeah. Uh, they even What's noticed that. that. So yeah, yeah. when I look at the Quran, it's a very seventh century kind of text and deriving modern values is very difficult like i mean thanks for watching this clip if you like this content please consider supporting the channel i have about 30 monthly supporters and i would like to get this number to at least 100 this will help me spend more time on this project details are below thank you so much this is abdullah samir signing out